What's up, Franco? Hello, Chris. So I'd like to get inside your brain because, you know, you really are truly the genius behind live show experience. Obviously, Peter Brook has inspired you tremendously, but was there a piece of theater that you saw before you discovered Peter Brook? Yeah, I began to feel how much theater can make you understand or at least question yourself about human being. And so Peter Brook came, Peter Brook came later uh, in, in uh, Paris, uh, Ariane Nushkin, Théâtre du Soleil, all these directors from the 70s impressed me a lot. You were putting together shows with non-actors to perform it. I wanted to be not doing theater for, for the people, but with the people. You were able to cultivate and see things differently from a different lens than we've ever seen. You, you know, you are touching a point that uh, I, I would say that this is the most important story of my life. When you first came to Vegas, I guess, creating Nouvelle Experience, it was a different Las Vegas. You had Siegfried and Roy, um, who kind of dominated the entertainment scene. They transform, you know, this city uh, into a, a family destination. You know, they were doing things that had never been done, the spectacle, animals, all of these things. And then you were bringing uh, essentially a, a, a new version of a circus in a tent in a parking lot. And what was that first experience with Vegas like? I remember when I saw the first time Siegfried and Roy, wow, you know, I never saw magic like this. I never saw a theater like this. I never saw such a huge, big production. I will never forget when uh, Steve Wynn was bringing me in downtown Las Vegas and telling me his story with Frank Sinatra, a lot of beautiful story. Imagine how me, coming from a small village in Italy, then a post-industrial city in La Louvière, and being there in Las Vegas, I felt that I was in a place where history was happening. Isn't it true that at some point when you were working on the stair, maybe it was the creation, that you actually banned Steve Wynn from coming to see it until you invited him? Is that true? It's absolutely true. So you have all of this wild success with Mystere. You're kind of redefining what entertainment is in Las Vegas. And now you're asked to kind of do something different. Top yourself. You have a bigger budget. And the idea is born, we are going to do a theater show in water. We have found the show. And it happened in one lunch where we did the storyline, we did really, oh, 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 we, the, we changed the paradigm. I took a scarf in my right hand and I put the scarf in my left hand and I say, I wanted the curtain open like this. If you ask Steve, who had the idea of bringing water uh, on, in a show? If you ask me, if you ask everybody, everybody will say, oh, it's me. And this is what makes a good idea. It's when everybody take and, and say that this is my idea, it means it's a good idea. It is probably one of the most iconic images. And you're all about images, tableaus. You're about taking fine art, you know, whether it's, you know, a director like Fellini or a, an artist like Dali and kind of creating these tableaus, these images that you can just sit and take a picture of every moment of the show and it would be a beautiful image that would say so much that speaks to um, the viewer. Because for you, what I gather, knowing you and working with you, it's not about language as far as speaking. It's about the language of emotion. It's about connecting. Explain to those who are watching now how you conceptualize and bring to fruition these incredible images that look like paintings coming to life. You touch a point very important for me. I still believe today that we all have one fundamental universal common language. And through the images, through, you know, if you look at, at the sunset, you will be moved 
by the sunset, you will be maybe happy or sad, depending on what you are going through in your life. And I think wherever you are in the world, we have the same unique, fundamental, common language. Typically in theater, you have a backstage area that they hide the things that need to be done technically. And what you managed to figure out was when, we had a, when you had to set up the, uh, the, uh, the net, instead of trying to hide the people, you kind of celebrate it and, and you take those moments and you make a tableau, a transition, and, and don't try to hide it. Yeah, this is what uh, I understand what you mean by celebrate, yes. So instead to hide or to try to hide, I decide to celebrate. And then it becomes part of the story, become part of the world that we are creating. You work with Cirque from 1985 until 1998. And then you made a hard decision to leave Cirque du Soleil to begin Dragon. I did not really stop to interact with Guy and the Cirque. We still worked on, we had to work on the Beatles, by the way. I worked, uh, I worked two years on the Beatles. And then, I didn't you know, know. Uh, the accident with uh, uh, Siegfried and Roy, the plan changed because they had to open the Mirage. And so I could not um, do the show at that date. It was too soon. So, and, um, but this brings me another thing. One day I received a call from Yoko Ono and she brought me in New York and I went, you know, in the apartment of John Lennon and she wow. told me a lot of tea. And she has a lot of drawing, painting of John Lennon. And, and she wanted to do something with the, this material. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> no, I, I, I was just asking, what was the reason why yeah. you decided to leave Cirque? You said it was two reasons. One, it was more family and personal. And then the other reason you didn't tell us yet. Yes, yes, yes. The other reason I have to say that the Cirque was so, you know, developing so, uh, such in a, such a big growth that, um, uh, it was difficult for me not to take a pause and think about creation. The creation, you know, we did a, such a great work that I, I had a little bit, uh, I was afraid that uh, Cirque would go to sell uh, its soul to, to the devil, I was seeing at the time. In my humble opinion, uh, when Cirque du Soleil lost Franco Dragon, and I've said this publicly, they've lost their soul and their heart and their way. How were you able to respect her as an artist and respect the fact that you're trying to create a show and walk that tightrope? With Celine, the first thing was to respect her and not impose her who she was not. It's to really to be, to pull out of her what she is. And that is really a testament to your greatness. It's a simple fundamental thing, but it's the human connection just when you're working with somebody to see what they can bring to the table. Can you just take us through the Lorev experience? Well, I didn't want to have another water show. If car will be a technological breakthrough, let's do Lorev based on human proximity. I remember the day of the premiere, the show was not ready. He had to grow. I tried to be maybe too audacious, to, to go too far, too fast, and break all the boundaries. It was darker. Uh, yes, that's the word. It was too dark at that moment. I have a question for you, Chris. How you deal, how you deal with, you know, when you open the show, the day of the premiere, and you have people that come to you and say, oh, bravo, yeah, fantastic. And uh, how, uh, so how you deal with that, although you know that you are not happy because you did not reach what you wanted to reach. So how you deal with this very sad moment it's, for me, it's, it's, for me it's sad. That's, that's the story of, 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 of my being. It's, I'm never happy. It can always be better. Yeah. And uh, 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 for me, I try to work even harder 
perfection is like water. You can't hold on to it. And it's something that you work as a human being and as an artist to perfect, but it always can be better. And I think that that's innate in most people that achieve success in their respected discipline. Like you, you could never be happy. If you're happy, then you might as well retire. Yeah, yeah. So when people come to me and say, great show, that was awesome. That's it. I thank them, but I'm like, yeah, but this wasn't right in there. Or yeah, but this is still going in. Oh yeah, this was still working on this. Same with you. You create a show, you work years, you bring it to life. There it is. Your vision is coming to life. You, you're impressed by it for a moment. You appreciate it for a moment. And then you say, yeah, but that can be better. That we need to change that. You start picking it apart. But that's the, the sign of a perfectionist. That's why you are who you are. That's why I aspire um, to be better because of you. Just to, to, to close the chapter of a premiere, you know, it's not good to have me in a premiere because I am only sad. And it's pity because people need to, to make party. And uh, this uh, sadness, and I see, you know, you have a face where even if you smile, you Chris, there is always a, a sadness behind your eyes. This is maybe our life is this, it's a tragic comedy. How to provoke God to send you gift in front of your eyes and capture this? It's a, this is what I, I think is our way to taste a little bit what eternity could mean. If you don't take risk, you, you will never achieve anything. A couple of quick questions. You uh, say ordinary creates extraordinary. We have to give the extraordinary. How to make something ordinary extraordinary. One of the books you love, Peter Brook, The Empty Space, he says, reality is a word with many meanings. The empty space for me means also the empty space that you need to leave to the audience because the audience has to have this space to be able to imagine their own story. If you fill all the space, if you tell, if you put everything on the nose of the audience, I mean, there is no space for the fantasy. And I love Robert Lepage, when he, say, he says that uh, the most visual medium is the radio. What is next and in the future of Franco Dragon? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Except I don't know, but uh, uh, next is for me to multiply the number of time where I can spend like tonight, Chris. I spent the time with you, not thinking about what was happening after, not before, I was here. I was here and we were talking like this. On 24 hours, I would like to spend at least uh, 23 hours doing theater creation and thinking about the show. I would not be nothing without these people, nothing without, you know, it's not a flattery uh, person like you. Also, I'd like to be fan. I am a fan of some people that admire, respect, and I want maybe to copy them. As a person, I, I like to copy the behavior of some person because when they are respectful, when they are true, real, this is something that um, make me wake up in the morning because I want to be to learn and to meet people like uh, you and be part of the world like what we are trying to do with the Creator United. And this is what we try to, to do. It's to give our talent to, to the world. And uh, voila. Thank you so much, uh, Franco. Um, it's been an amazing experience. On behalf of Las Vegas Creators United, I'm Chris Angel, and thank you so very much for watching.
Hey, this is Chris Angel. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please unite with us and help the Las Vegas entertainment community. It's easy to do. Just go to dragon.com and click on the donate button. A little bit will go a long way. Thanks so much for watching. Watch the entire unedited talk available now on the Chris Angel YouTube channel.